And that was like, you know, goosebumps for me. Like, here's this 14 year old girl saying, no, I want to, I want, I want to go to Fit Futures because I want to take the day off me. I love the physical benefits that we, that our kids get from our program, but it's some of this stuff that I think is the most powerful where they, they make this connection that they understand that exercise makes me feel better. It makes, it changes my mood. It turns a bad day into a good day. What's up, fitness friends? Welcome back to the Future of Fitness podcast and interview series. This is your host, Eric Malzone. And this is episode number 159. I get to talk to Samantha Mathers. She is the uh, founder, maybe co-founder, uh, I apologize if I get that wrong, of Fitter Futures out uh, near Brisbane, Australia. And it's one of the very few gyms in the world that I know that's purely dedicated to youth fitness. And uh, if you are a fan of the show, you listen to my episodes. Well, I know I kind of have a soft spot in my heart for youth fitness, and rightfully so, because it truly is the future. And we're facing uh, obesity epidemics in so many countries worldwide, and it really can be solved with very, very simple things of, of getting kids active and getting them into great habits for life, right? Not only for their fitness, for their health, but for their resiliency and their ability to deal with challenges in life and and how they socialize and all of that. So it's, it's critical. I love the messaging that Sam has in here. It's beautiful. Um, she's in the trenches doing it every day. Her business is thriving and uh, she's awesome. She's just really great. And uh, I think you'll get a lot out of it, whether you train uh, adults, youth, or if you're just a human being. So um, this episode is brought to you by uh, two of my proud companies, Certified Course Creation. So if you go to certifiedcoursecreation.com, you can learn a little bit more about what Kate and I are doing for people and helping them essentially fulfill their dreams of having an online accredited certification program. And uh, working with companies like Beyond Macros, uh, the Online Traders Federation, um, all kinds of big brands that I can't say yet because they're not done. But we're, we're doing a lot of really cool stuff. And it's not just the big brands, but it's the, the individuals um, as well who have something very special and unique to offer. Um, to get out there. So if you are looking, if you do have a unique set of knowledge um, that you want to get out there, um, you're ready to stop training your time for money um, and you want to make a bigger impact um, by scaling yourself and your knowledge, then, then go check it out, book a time with me and we'll chat some more and see uh, where your idea fits in the market. Uh, secondly, level5mentors.com. So Ken and Druco and I uh, have partnered. We have a ton of experience, um, not only in just the fitness and health industry, but, but entrepreneurship in general. And uh, we're having a great time. We're helping a lot of people grow their business. And if you're feeling stuck, right, maybe you don't feel like uh, money is the only thing that's important to you as an entrepreneur. Well, that's where we come in. And the name level five comes from the five freedoms that we've designated of time, money, relationships, purpose, and health right? That's the metrics that we look at. And if that makes sense to you, that resonates with you, then, then go on uh, to our website and book a call with me as well. So yeah, Level 5 Mentors, making a huge impact, super excited to be part of it and helping entrepreneurs every day because entrepreneurs are the ones who make a change. And if I can help those people, then I'm, uh, I'm doing my, my life's work. So without further ado, this is episode number 159. This is Samantha Mathers at a future, Fitter Futures. Uh, enjoy the ride. Boom. And we're live. Sam, welcome to the show. Eric, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm uh, really, I'm looking forward to this interview quite a bit. There is, um, you know, if people listen to the show, they, they know that, I guess, lack of a better term, I have a soft spot for youth fitness um, and what it means mm -hmm. and, and the ne you know, necessity of it nowadays. It's not just uh, a thing that we do. It's something we need to do for, for the youth. And uh, as a recovering chubby kid, um, you know, getting into sports, it played, <laughs> you know, fitness played a, a significant role in my upbringing and, and still does today. And, um, plus, you know, the name of your business, Fitter Futures, I mean, it just goes well with the name of the podcast and all that. So, um, yeah, it does. I'll stop talking. I'm going to let you tell your story, Sam. Give everyone a little background. Sure. You. Um, well, I was always an active kid. Um, I was a jack of all trades, master of none. So I played lots of different sports growing up. Um, and my parents did a great job of keeping us busy with that. And it probably it's only now really that I appreciate the value of having had that kind of upbringing. Right. Um, you know, I was able to continue to be active right through my teenage years and then as, an, as a young adult and then, you know, as I've had, I've got two young girls who are 11 and um, 10. So right through that and it's always been, I always say it's, you know, part of my mental health plan is 
to move daily and to exercise. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's been a lifestyle for me and, um, I've always felt passionately about it. And, uh, you know, I didn't start off in this business. I actually was a corporate lawyer and a management consultant for many years. Um, but always had, was always involved in sport. Um, I think I've always had this, um, natural tendency to want to coach and mentor and train. Like, um, you know, I wanted to be a teacher when I was little and then, you know, I coached a lot of teams and, you know, did some volunteer coaching in a, um, in a CrossFit gym, actually, we're helping them run their CrossFit kids program. And I guess that's where the, when I first discovered that this was actually what I was really passionate about. And so, uh, probably about six years ago now, I remember having a conversation with my husband and saying, um, you know, if, if money didn't matter, if I could just follow what I'm, you know, do what I'm really passionate, genuinely passionate about, it would be, um, you know, coaching youth and coaching kids, you know, as a, you know, as, as my thing and trying to reach as many kids as we can through that. And, um, now we're six years down the track and, uh, three years ago, Fitter Futures was born and, um, you know, we just keep going from strength to strength and getting, um, you know, bigger in our programs. And, um, you know, I'm, I've never been happier. I feel it's a very fulfilling and rewarding, um, job if you can call it that. I don't even think of it as work. I probably work way bigger hours than I ever did when I was a corporate lawyer in an international law firm, honestly. Yeah, that's um, something. Yeah, but, um, you know, I just feel so passionately about it. And I think that, um, you know, certainly my, my corporate background it de- has definitely helped me with, I think, getting to where we are now in such a short, um, you know, time frame. Uh, just having a really good understanding of business and strategy and all those components that you need to get right to have a successful business. I think, you know, without that, um, the journey might have been slightly different. But, um, yeah, it's it's awesome. We've got a great community. Uh, we're a Brand X Method Lab, one of only three in the world, um, which uh, is um, something I'm really proud of and proud to be part of. And uh, we're just opening our brand new, our state-of-the-art facility in four days' time. So uh, it's exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get into the facility quite a bit. And it's, um, you know, I think a lot of people resonate with what you're saying. You know, there's no shortage of passion in the fitness industry, right? Everybody gets into it for really, most of the time gets into it for really good reasons. They want to make a bigger impact. They want to do something that they truly enjoy, something that's rewarding. They want to help people. Um, the challenge is when they're forced to the realization of, well, I got to learn business, right? (laughs) And and all the the trials and tribulations that come with that side of things, which is a huge component of it. And um, luckily you had that background, which I've seen a lot of, you know, you kind of see two, and I'm going to oversimplify this. You see like two different types of people getting into, you know, especially gym ownership is people who great coaches, right? Super passionate. And they decide that this is the next step in their career. So they go mm-hmm. open a facility, right? And then they're like, oh my God, I have to learn the business side. And then there's people who like you who come in with a business background, management background to come in and are passionate about the fitness thing. And those two things meld. And generally good things happen in the second scenario, sometimes in the first, but most of the time in the second. And uh, so that's, I think that's a key, a key success factor for you. And um, so what, let's take a step back. What is Fitter Futures? So tell us what it is exactly. So, um, Fit of Futures is a functional movement, functional fitness, um, uh, offering, and we do have a, tr- a facility where we offer that, but we also work a lot with schools as well. So we will go to schools and deliver our program. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's based on the brand X method, um, around, um, you know, their methodology around coaching youth, uh, and, you know, all of our coaches are trained in, um, brand X as well. Uh, and you know, it's really about, um, you know, building formidable humans. And, uh, you know, we do that through movement. We cater to all different ability levels. Uh, so it's very inclusive. So we have, um, that will, in terms of age groups, we're sort of fi- from five right through to um, 19 um, is our eldest team. He, he's actually old enough to be training with adults now, but he really enjoys, he's made some good friendships and, um, you know, has enjoyed that journey. So, um, and also wants to be a coach with us, which is really cool. Nice. Um, but you know, we get, um, 
a really broad spectrum of uh, kids that come to us. So we've got, uh, you know, ranging from the highly athletic and competitive groups who, you know, some of them are representing at national level in their sport um, with aspirations to, you know, go to Commonwealth Games or get, you know, university scholarships with Harvard through to, you know, um, right and, you know, right through the other end of the spectrum with kids and teens who have never found a sport that they like, who really don't enjoy exercise, who are very, um, you know, who are unfit, who are carrying weight, who lack a lot of confidence. And we, the magic of our program is we can actually, we cater really well to both those groups and everybody in between. And, you know, that's why we have such a high conversion rate when people come and try our classes um, and a retention rate, because I think we've just got this a really good culture um, a really good um, team of coaches and a really good program underpinning it, uh, which makes sure that everybody's being looked after. You know, we're doing things that's in the best interests of each athlete. Um, we're really conscious about um, the progression and making sure that it's right for every for each athlete. And by doing that, you know, they experience success and that, you know, those good endorphins that come with, um, you know, feeling like I've, I've done something great and they can see their improvement. And, you know, that's where, um, that sort of in, internal motivation comes then for them to want to keep coming back. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, I like to think of it as the way I explain it to people. If you think of like a pyramid um, and the top of the pyramid is kind of like your, you know, peak performance or high performance in sport or in, in life, uh, you know, you, you want to make the base of that pyramid as big as you can. And that base of that pyramid is, is your physical literacy, you know, your ability to do, you know, really foundational um, movements and things that we have to use in everyday life. Um, you know, in the brand X language, we call them primal movements, but, um, it's also about, you know, the hand eye coordination and being able to kick and throw a ball and then, um, you know, having balance and, you know, agility and, um, and strength. So the bigger the base of that pyramid is, the, the greater your potential is, you know, to, you know, to do anything. Um, and so, yeah, it's that broad general fitness space we're trying to develop with um, kids and teens uh, so that they've got a great platform to do anything off, you know, and it's not just about, you know, and I explain it to the, the kids who are specialising early in a sport, which we're seeing more and more often, and that's a whole new, whole different topic. Hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's risk with that. There's downside to that. Um, you know, it, it narrows the base of that pyramid because you're getting really good in one, you know, in one area. Um, but you're also probably neglecting a whole lot of other movement that you're not training because it's not, you know, people don't see it as being relevant to your sport. And, um, you know, if I choose swimmers as an example, um, you know, it's swimming for those athletes. It's a massive sport here in Australia as it is um, in the US. Uh, also a very demanding sport in terms of training load that they put on those kids. And there's actually not, for those kids who are in those programs, not a lot of room to do anything else but swim. Um, you know, they, we see a lot of other, a lot of overuse injuries that come from that. But the thing that probably concerns me the most is that a lot of these kids get to like 15 or 16 and swimming's not fun anymore. They don't want to do it anymore, you know, and then they drop out of swimming, but you know, their, their ability to, um, run, kick, throw, uh, you know, do all these other movements, which, you know, are very common in other sports. They're not very good at. So that's tough as a teenager anyway, right? Like from a confidence point of view that, you know, a lot of us are feeling very self-conscious and, um, you know, to go from being really, really good at a sport to then switch into a sport where you're probably starting, you might be starting at the bottom because you haven't had a lot of practice, you know, at anything like it. That's a, that's a tough call for a lot of kids, you know, and, um, you know, some of them drop out and, takes them a while before they find something else that they feel comfortable enough or confident enough to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm generalizing, but it's, it's a, you know, it, it happens. So we want to make that pyramid as big as possible. So they've got as, as many, um, you know, different tools in their toolkit and, um, you know, their athletic ability is, is as broad as it can be. So they can like move in any direction as teenagers, as adults, um, you know, for the rest of their life. So that's what we're trying to set them up for. Yeah, that's awesome. And there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of research now backing what you guys do, right? I mean, mm. that concept of like, 
Um, you know, not specializing too early. That's like you said, that's a whole nother conversation, but I, I can give, so you brought up swimming and I'll give a personal anecdote because I was thinking about this. Like my brother and I, um, both were competitive swimmers early. Like I started at five. I think you started around the same age, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe like I, you know, around seven, we both got put in a club. Um, I, you know, my brothers will learn me. He went all in on swimming, right? Double days by, you know, um, seventh grade morning and evenings, uh, full ride to college, all this stuff and burned out hard his sophomore year in college. Like didn't even want to look at a pool again. Right. Just couldn't do it. It too much pressure, too much work. It wasn't even, I, I got separated a little bit because I wasn't, it was a blessing. I wasn't as good of a swimmer as my brother. <laughs> right. Cause no one really paid attention to me. I was kind of chubby. Right. No one really paid attention. Um, so by that nature, it was a blessing back then. I hated it. Right. Cause my brother was just like, tall tan stud, right? Everybody knew my brother, but I was just like this, you know, pale little chubby kid kind of walking around trying to fit in a Speedo uh, every afternoon. (laughs) And, uh, you know, so by nature, I I gravitated towards other sports. I played football and basketball and all these things. And then when the time came, I found water polo. Um, I associated very well with it, right? And I found that that was my love and thank God I found it, right? And I played it for a very long time. Now, here's the funny part. Um, If my brother's listened to this, he'll probably call me right after, but if you watch my brother throw a football at the age of, you know, <laughs> 45, uh, it's not, not pretty. It's not know? pretty. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I'm like, stop, stop throwing with your left hand, man. Oh wait, that is your right hand. Um, but you know, it's, it's not just at that age, it follows you through life, right? Like yeah. you get that base of sport. And I think that's really important. And then you're starting to see all the, um, you know, books and movies coming out about how, you know, Tiger Woods was the, the rarity of like, you know, sports specificity, specificity, tough word at an early age. And, you know, the more, you know, there's way more success stories on the other side of people who stayed broad and then generalized maybe, you know, mid to late teens and then really went for it in their twenties. Um, so it's, it's a really cool concept. And I, so I want to back up to some of the stuff you said, uh, Sam, one of them was you kind of have those two, um, you have like the, the fitness athletic oriented kids and then you have the ones that really aren't. How do you, um, in today's day and age, how do you capture their attention enough to train them? Like what's, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. How, how do you get them involved? It, it starts from the minute they walk through the door. So, you know, you've got to create the facility and the environment that, exci- that, inter- that is interesting for them, right? That's exciting for them. And I mean, our new facility is like a whole new level of that. Um, you know, it, it's the way you welcome them into the group. It's the way you engage with them through the class. It's the way you, you know, that the, the programming, um, that we use through brand X you know, is designed around what's, um, developmentally and, um, you know, age appropriate, but also, uh, you know, psycho, the psychosocial aspects of that and what different, what kids need, um, at different ages and what, and what's fun to them at different ages too. I mean, fun to a five-year-old is different to what's fun to a 10-year-old, which is different to what's fun to a 15-year-old. So, you know, understanding that is really important. Uh, And then, um, you know, it's, it's about the the way you deliver the class, the way you coach the kids. It's, it's, it's learning very early, as early as you can, the personality type of that kid, what makes them tick, what do they respond well to and, and, you know, playing to those strengths as well. And I don't mean playing in a um, trite way. I mean like, you know, if you've got a you've got an athlete who you know is like really anxious or really nervous or really unsure um, of themselves and you can tell that pretty quickly, right, from the minute, you know, within a few seconds of meeting them, um, you know, you make sure you're giving them heaps of encouragement and positive reinforcement and all that sort of thing through the class. And, you know, they get the high five and the pat on the back saying, Jish, you did so well today. Like, you know, um, so it's all these, com- it's not one thing. It's like a combination of all these things um, where they leave the place feeling like that was awesome. You know, that was a really good experience. And it's not to say it's easy. Like, um, you know, it's not meant to be easy. We're, we're trying to challenge kids so that they can grow because we've got this um, quote on the wall in our, in our new facility, you know, all progress takes place outside your comfort zone. So we, we, we're trying to, edge kids into that and some kids embrace it some kids are really uncomfortable but adults are the same right in that way not in not in a lot of other ways but certainly in terms of you know 
you know, people's sort of tendencies towards, you know, feeling uncomfortable. Um, and it's just knowing how to adjust that for each child. So you, you can't approach it like every, every kid's the same because they're not. And, um, you know, and there are some, you know, there'll be some kids who thrive on, uh, you know, their thing is always, you know, wanting to progress and they're competitive by nature and all that sort of stuff. You got to sort of channel that in a really positive way. So, um, you know, they get what they need out of the session as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And I, you know, so you guys, your, your facility is, is all youth, right? Um, how does it, it differ ha- in maybe some fundamental ways? Yeah. Am, so am I correct in saying that? Yeah. Well, um, and in our new facility, we're actually, we are adding adults into our program because we wanted oh. to create a place where, um, the whole family can, can be can train because yep. we think that's another really important element is that um, opportunities to connect the families and and we also think too if you, you know if you've got um, a family invested in your gym or your facility because they all love it right the stickiness is there as well yep. you know um, so but yeah up until like you know up until now we've we've purely focused on on the youth space. Um, I'm sorry. What was your question? I yeah, I actually never got to the question. So, how, how does it differ? You know, if you're if someone's listening, they're like, "Well, you know, I want to go start shifting towards youth, right? Focusing more attention." How how does it differ from like a business side? Like, you know, how do yeah. you how do you attain new clients? How do you you know get them on ramped? What, what's the what's the experience like? How does that differ? Have you been intentional about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so we were very clear from the beginning around. Um, where we wanted to position ourselves in terms of, um, you know, in this market of youth fitness. Uh, and, you know, for us, I mean, being a Brand X Method Training Centre, we, we were the first ones in Australia and, and the only one until, you know, recently. I think then there's one in Sydney and, um, and uh, Perth possibly. Um, so being very deliberate around what is it we're going to offer and how are we going to do it? And, you know, what are our critical success factors going to be? So the thing with youth that's different to the adult model, a, a big thing is, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times with adults, when they sign up for a membership, it's a fairly constant thing for a period of time, you know, like we actually don't have any minimum term commitments in our memberships. Um, yes. my, my philosophy around that is, you know, I want people to come to our gym and train because they want to be there, you know, that they want to come and we've got to do everything we can to provide that experience so that they, that they want to keep coming. Um, obviously there has to be some buy-in from their side too, because, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. So, you know, there's only so much we can do, but, um, you know, we, yeah, we want to sort of create that experience so that there's nowhere else they'd rather be anyway. But the difference you know, adults are uh, a fairly constant, be, you know, beast, assuming you're providing a really good service. Kids are seasonal. So, you know, in our, in Australia, we have like four school terms a year, you know, so there's like two semesters broken. They're like 10 week blocks. And so, and they, and so schedules for kids change every term, you know, so even if you're doing like a really great job and they love it, it doesn't mean that they can keep coming next term for, you know, twice a week or once a week even, you know. So there'll be times where they have to, you know, they leave you for a term because they just physically can't fit it in or whatever. But you want to just, you want to make sure they come back when, when it fits in. So you've got this challenge of like, um, it's not a churn rate because they're not leaving you because they, you know, they're unhappy. They just can't be with you for, you know, a 10 week block or whatever. So. Um, you know, that's a challenge from a business point of view. And then, you know, you've got school holidays that interrupt things too. A lot of parents don't want to be paying for kids' programs because they're going away, right? So, you know, imagine like a membership model where you're having to pause memberships like every two weeks or, or, or every 10 weeks. You've got two weeks of downtime. You know, you've got to offer yeah. something else. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah so that's how, that's tricky, right? you yeah, very. Um, so that's, you know, from a from a cash flow and, a you know, that, that kind of perspective, that's a challenge. Um and then the other thing I think is really important to understand is that you've got two clients when you're training youth. You've got the child that's in the room and you've got their parent. And the parent's paying the money. Um, 
but the kid's the one who's got to want to go as well. So you actually need to keep both happy. Um, it's not enough to just have a, a child that really loves it if the parent's unhappy, right? Because they'll just walk if they're not happy. Um, you know, so there's, there's almost like it's, it's, it's a bit more work um, to re, I think, um, in that sense. But, uh, you know, if you, I think what the reason, one of the reasons we have been so successful is because we've been so focused on making that youth program what it is and, 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 a, and the best program that we can. Um, as opposed to, I think a lot of other gyms probably are more focused on the adult space, offer a kids program as a service to their members, aren't, aren't truly invested in trying to make that an awesome program. Um, because it might not even be, might, it might be cost neutral for them or, you know, it may not even be that, like it might make enough just to pay their coaches. So they're not really, they don't see it as a big, as an, you know, a focus for them. Right. Um, but I, I really think that to do it properly, it has to be, you know, there's, it has to be, there's, there's a lot, if you want to, if you want to be a really good youth coach, you need to, you need to commit to understanding all there is to know about how youth, how training youth is different from training adults. And that's where Brand X comes in. Yeah. That's a, that's extremely powerful point too, because I mean, as you know, with the gyms that, I worked in and ran and owned and, you know, kids youth programs were always secondary and it was so challenging. I mean, I don't know. It it was, I'm going to say all the things that a lot of business owners say. It was a hyper, you know, hyper competitive market, right? All the excuses that, you know, (laughs) facility owners and fitness professionals come up with. But I do feel like that was somewhat true within the youth area because, you know, the only time that we could really, the best time to launch for us for a kids program was the beginning of summer, right? Um, and if you go to Santa Barbara, California, you look in the local, you know, weekly paper, um, right before summer and you see the sheer volume of summer camps and options from, you know, martial arts to sports specific to you name it, right. It's overwhelming. Like they're marketed to so hard in that one, you know, that period of time. So yeah, I feel that. I mean, that, that I could see that being a really big challenge because it was true. It was like, you get, we get kids for a season right? Especially an athlete, get him for a little while, right? Um, mm. Erica Suter, who I work with, who, who does, uh, you know, use soccer, same thing. The challenges are, you know, her summers are crazy. Like she's working, you know, 14 hour days consistently all summer. And then all of a sudden everything just drops off. Everyone goes back to school, the season start. What do you do? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Luckily she's got an online a very online, you know, very strong online program. So yeah, I mean, is there ways that you, how do you plan for that? How do you, how do you work yeah. around those challenges? Look, um, I think a big part of it is, uh, getting your members to really understand the value in what you're offering. And it's not just the value that you're bringing to helping your, that child in that, in a sport. It's actually, there's value in trying to maintain this kind of training all year round, you know, and, and finding ways to fit it in. Now, um, you know, an example, I've got a a 15 year old boy who's, um, you know, wanted to be more competitive at rowing and he's been with us now for a couple of years. Uh, Actually he's 16 now. He started with us when he was 14 and um, you know, he's, he's just going from strength to strength to strength. And now he's, you know, made, um, you know, state teams and, you know, he's on that, on that path of escalation. He's joining other clubs that have got more intensive kind of growing programs. And, you know, there was, which means he's the expectations on him around his training loads also increased. And it got to a point where he was also rowing for his school and, um, you know, there was like, okay, so something's going to give, like you, you can't fit, you know, all your sessions with the school in, all the sessions with your club in and all the sessions with Fitter Futures in. Um, but you know, he, so he had a choice then about, you know, what do I drop? Uh, but you know, could could see the value and the benefit he was getting from our program, how much stronger he was, could, could make the connection between the, a lot of the improvement that he's been having is because his body is a lot more, is a lot stronger and he's, um, you know, it's the work he's doing with us. Um, even though some of the other clubs offer like strength and conditioning training. So we're essentially that for him. Um, so instead of dropping a session with us, he ended up dropping his school growing so that 
um, you know, he could continue to come to, you know, to us two or three times a week for his, you know, for the work he does with us. Plus, um, for us, it's actually this, you know, our, our gym is a place for him where he really can be himself and um, he loves the community and, you know, no, oh, there's a whole another story with him. Like his his grades at school have improved immensely. His confidence has improved immensely. His mum was saying how he um yeah you know, he used to be reluctant to you know in PE and sport at school to try different things because he didn't feel that sort of confident with it. But he's a very capable boy. He's a very capable athlete now, and um you know he's putting his hand up for everything. So hmm. that's a cool. I mean you know I, I love what we the physical stuff our program does, but there's a whole lot of other um, benefits. But I think really, um, you know, it's it's just trying to get people to understand the value in what we do, why there's value in continuing as much as you can to sort of keep consistency with it. And we actually do have, you know, a really good um, retention rate with that. You do have times where, you know, kids get overscheduled and, um, you know, they have to drop back a session a week or, um, you know, they have to skip a term with you, but, um, you know, that, that some of that stuff's out of your control. Uh, but the main thing is that so long as, you know, you've got that relationship with your clients where they value what you do, you know that when that window op- opens up again, they'll be back, you know. Yeah. And, I've, you know, I've got a, an athlete who's been in that boat for the last um, last four months. She's a a competitive soccer player um, and she's in a Queensland Academy sport squad and, you know, she, she like physically couldn't come, you know, for, for that amount of time while she was in this camp and this, you know, um, her season, she's back, you know, next week. So you just want them to keep coming back. Um, but it does, it does mean that you have to be on top of, uh, you know, growing your client base as well so that when, you know, when you do have, you know, that 10% of people who can't sort of come back that turn that you've, you've got new clients that are coming in, you know. Well, I think that's key too, is, you know, when we were talking about earlier about the two different populations, there's the, the athletic population and then there's the ones that, you know, um, don't actively participate in sports. I mean, that that secondary group is so big, right? And yeah, that's the type of group that you can have on a year-long um you know, membership and, you know, I know you don't, I didn't do contracts either. Um, but you know, that's probably, I mean, that's, we talk about one of the conversations that comes up often here is like technology and, you know, how, how do we use tech in the fitness industry and everyone's worried about, you know, Pelotons at home and things like that. Like, well, you know, we're only reaching maybe 20% of the population in the United States and the global population, we're talking about 1%. And this is the, the percentage of, of people who go to gyms or have trainers or actively engage in some sort of program. Right. Meanwhile, there's this whole other pool that we're not really looking at. And I feel like that's, you know, one thing that's great about what you're doing is if we can get, you know, even a, a 1%, right. Active at a young age, that's, that's a group of people who are going to you know really value fitness and health in their lives. And they're going to be active parts of, you know, all kinds of fitness communities across the globe. And I think that's a really key indicator that people need to look at, you know, a foresight of like, okay, it's not just this month, right. Or even this year, it's the next 20 years of fitness. And what does that look like? And if we're getting people now, getting people in the right habits, right. And then we can really, uh, you know, support the industry as a whole. There's, there's something that you brought up back there, same with the, the anecdote about, or the story about the, the boy, right. Um, you said that he, he comes to a place that he, he can be himself. Expand yep. on that. Like, what does that mean? What is that? Give me some examples. So, yeah, look, um, we've got, we've, we've always had a really good culture in our gym of inclusiveness, um, and kindness and, um, you know, that there's, you know, there's no egos and all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, um, we've got such diversity in the personalities of kids who come in gym, like I sort of explained before, you know, lots of different backgrounds. And, you know, it's also nice to see kids um, coming together and forming friendships outside of their school groups because, honestly, like a lot of them need a break from that, right, so uh, as well. Um, so, you know, he's, I guess it's it's probably because, um, you know, we, we do have that diversity. We've got such a good team of coaches who really know how to connect, you know, with kids and teens. It, it, it amazes me some of the things that, you know, these teens are, you know, happy to share with us that, you know, conversations that 
starters, like, you know, how was your day? And they'll say, good. You know, that's the standard answer you get from any <laughs> gift. Good. I said, oh, I said, you got any, got another word for it? And they went, oh, well, actually, it was pretty shit. Like, you know, I didn't have a great day. And then they'll sort of like, you know, tell you why it was a, why it was a shitty day. Um, but, you know, they, they know they can come to the gym and um, leave all that behind them and, you know, we've got, like we've got this really healthy culture of, you know, there's no judgment and that, that sort of kindness of inclusive. There's a place everybody can just be there themselves, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned to you before we started um, the podcast today about the things that excite me most is like when I hear comments from, 12 year old girls saying, actually, Sina was 13, coming here on a Monday night is the favorite part of my week. You know, so the highlight of her week, she was in grade seven, like first year of high school, was coming to the gym. You know, um, another kid, 11 uh, year old boy, came to us um, carrying weight, had put on a lot of weight in the last 12 months. Mum had said, you know, he lost a lot of confidence. He loved doing like scouts, like boy scouts, but was even, uh, you know, a bit reluctant to be doing some of those activities because he can't do what he used to do. He can't climb things like he used to because he's heavier. Um, you know, he wants to play inline hockey, which is like, you know, it's our version of like ice hockey when we don't have ice. It's like hockey on skates, inline skates. Um, you know, but he was struggling and, um, you know, she found us and said it thought it'd be really good for his fitness and trying to sort of build his confidence. We have a lot of parents who come to us because their kids are lacking confidence um, and wanting to help them, you know, regain that. Uh, so he came to his first session and it was, he, I could tell he found it hard. Like it was challenging for him. Um, you know, I would, I'd run for him for some of the, you know, some of it we had a bit of a run going on. And so I was like walking and jogging beside him, just sort of have, chatting to him and asking him about, you know, his hockey and all that. A um, bit of a distraction too because I could tell that he was sort of labouring a bit with the with the effort. Um, you know, we always follow up after their first trial session, what did you think, you know, and um, Riley actually wrote back to me himself and he said, um, and this I quote, quote you, he said, well, I didn't really enjoy it but I know it's really good for me so I'm going to keep coming anyway, right? So then I, I had a bit of a laugh at that because I thought I actually know that he he enjoyed it. What he didn't enjoy was being uncomfortable, but I felt like he actually enjoyed the experience. So I think he's he was associating enjoyment with, you know, how did I find the work, you know, the workout. Um, and I spoke to his mum afterwards and she said the same thing. She goes, oh, no, I think he had a really good time. I think he just didn't enjoy, like, that being, being uncomfortable, you know. And I said, yeah, I agree with you 100%. So two weeks later, we ran into school holidays and um, we ran a school holiday program and Riley came a lot um, in those holidays and, you know, one day, one day before we start, how's your holidays been? And good, you know, standard answer. And um, so I said, you yeah, know, well, what's been the highlight of your holidays? And um, he said, oh, coming to the gym. This is like two weeks ago I got the email from what? this same kid saying, yeah. I didn't really enjoy it, but, you know, I know it's good for me. And now two weeks later, he's telling me it's the highlight of his holidays, you know, his school holidays. So, I mean, you know, you can see the smile on my face. It was like, you know, it lit up my world. I was like, that's fantastic, you know. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, kids being able to be themselves, uh, you know, I could, there's so many stories I could share. Like, um, you know, 15, 16-year-old boy, uh, he's been training with us for many years uh, and his dad told me this story actually, um, you know, he missed out on making the team he wanted to make at school in rugby and he was like bitterly disappointed about it. And, um, you know, they were driving back from school that day and he was just like, oh, I had a bad day and didn't make the team and, um, and you know, he's feeling really tired and his dad said, you want to just go home? And he goes, no, no, I want to, I want to go to, I want to go to, I want to go to the gym. I want to go to Fit Futures because I always feel better. I always feel better after I've trained. You know, and there's just like so many stories like that. You know, another another girl, fourteen year old girl, um, been training with us now for six months. She actually had a brain tumor last year, um, so she was twelve months of treatment uh, with, uh, you know, which is you know massive for her. Uh, she's in the clear now, but she got after twelve months of being not being able to exercise, having a lot of medication and surgeries and other things. Um, 
she got the clearance to come back into exercise. Her mum, you know, she used to play netball, didn't want to go back to netball, was lacking a lot of confidence. Um, mum said, you've got to do something like your exercise. Your doctors have told you exercises. You need to do this. It's going to be good for your recovery. It's going to be good for your health. Um, mum pretty much like pushed her through the door and said, you're going to give this a try, you know? So she was reluctant, um, to start with and, um, really quiet and shy kind of girl. Now she's like, well, actually it didn't even take six months. It was like within, you know, a month she was chatter, 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 bubbly, you know, in, in the classes. She went from coming once a week to being on a full membership. She comes like three, four times a week. Um, she's got fitter. She's got stronger. She's, she's, she actually started in our team. We have a team girls class um, that we offer because we find, you know, some girls feel more comfortable coming into that. She went from just doing team girls class. To now she's, she's happy to join the regular team classes with the boys. And her mum has said to me, you know, I cannot believe this is the same kid. Like six months ago, you would not have got her anywhere near one of those teen classes where there were boys, like no way in the world. And she loves it, you know, and, and she doesn't do any other sport. This is her thing. This is what she does to keep fit. And um, she absolutely loves it. And uh, she had every six months they have to go for checkups with her, um, you know, with her medical history and it's always an anxious time for them. You know, they spend the whole day in hospital waiting test results. Uh, and she had that recently and she got, you know, it was all good, um, was a good result, but her mum was saying it's a really draining day. You know, there's the lead up to that too, which is like, you know, everyone's feeling nervous and anxious. And so, you know, they finished at the hospital and it's like, oh yeah, thank God. And, um, she said to her daughter, do you want to just go home? And, um, she said, no, I want to go to, I want to go to Fitter Futures. I want to take the day off me. And that was like, you know, goosebumps for me. Like here's this 14 year old girl saying, no, I want to, I want, I want to go to Fit Futures because I want to take the day off me. That's so, nice. you know, for me, it's like, I love the physical benefits that we, that our kids get from our program, but it's some of this stuff that I think is the most powerful where they, they make this connection that they understand that exercise makes me feel better. It makes, it changes my mood. It, turns a bad day into a good day. Um, I can, I know, I can, I know, you know, what it's doing for me, like how good it is for me. And that's why I want to keep coming back. And, you know, it's not because they're, uh, they're not coming back because they're obsessed with someone, how someone looks on Instagram and that they want to look like that. You know, we're very much about pushing that message around. It's actually about how, how you feel, what it does for you. Um, it's not, a, it's not about, you know, trying to look a certain way or, you know, that sort of the, the vanity side of it. Like, so yeah, that's maybe that, you know, does that explain why maybe kids feel they can be themselves? Like they've clearly, it's this kind of oasis for them, I think, you know, where they can escape a lot of the other shit that goes on in their lives, yeah. you know? I mean, just, adolescence, adolescence is brutal. I mean, yeah. You know, it was brutal when I was young, you know, but nowadays you add in, you know, social media aspect of things and, you know, this, um, you know, expectations and comparisons and, you know, all kinds of things and bullying and all that is brutal. I mean, just watching, yeah. you know, I don't have kids, but watching my nieces and nephews, I got six of those, you know, going through their, as they evolve through adolescence and through, I'm like, God, those are problems I never even thought of when I was young. Right. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Like, you know, alternative Instagram accounts and bullying and like, I'm like, what? Like, that's a thing like that. And then some of the things that are said are just rough and to have a, a place like that where, you know, um, and that's what I was, I had a feeling we get to some good stuff when I asked you that question about being themselves, because that's critical. I think that's ultimately what, what drives kids to, to come back, right? Is this ability to have a safe haven, to have something. It's like that, you know, the Starbucks third place, you have your home, you have your school, and then you have that yeah. place that you can go yeah. to when you can just be right. And I think that's um, something it sounds like you've been intentionally creating for, for years now. Yeah. And, you know, um, also kind of trying to educate them too around, how you know exercise is good for managing stress so sometimes you'll see kids turning up less often around exam time or assessment time you know because they've got they've got to study you know 
um, or they got too much, you know. And I'm and we're so, and I would say to them, you know, you, this is like the time when you actually need to move the most, you know, like um, take that take that an hour out of your afternoon, come in here. You don't have to like you don't have to, you know, smash yourself. Like just come and work out and you know get rid of the you just just you know get rid of the stress. You'll actually be more productive when you go home. So you'll probably study better, you know. Um, just messages like that um, so that they really try and learn that it's actually exercise is, a, is a, such an important tool for their just general wellness, you know, and mental well-being as well. And resiliency. I mean, isn't that what life's all about? I mean, you, life's going to come at you hard, right? I don't care who you are. You know, there's going to be some, <laughs> there's going to be multiple yeah. times, almost like a never ending stream of, of things in life that are going to come at you hard and, and building that resiliency and showing kids that there's ways to cope with it. Um, you know, that are very healthy and, uh, and that they can lean on people and they have a community and all that stuff. I mean, there's nothing, nothing wrong with any of that. It's all, it's all good. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, resilience is a big, uh, a big part of our program, like helping kids build resilience. And I think a lot of, parents are looking for that as well these days. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, I think, our, I don't know about your school system, but you know, there's a, the, the culture seems to be shifting more towards not wanting to see kids fail or let kids fail <laughs> for fear of like, you know, Oh, it's terrible. But, yeah. You know, there's, there's so much you learn from that. Um, and you know, that growth mindset is a big part of the style, you know, that we coach in and, um, you know, you'll see kids, you know, he'll be, Oh, I can't do that. Or, you know, um, you know, I'm willing to maybe try some new things and you, you know, you've got to know when to push and when to sort of back off and all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, the overarching mes message is it's not, you can't do that. It's just, you can't do that yet. Hmm. You know, and this, but this is where you start. Like, let's just get, let's just work on this, you know? And, and if we, something as simple as a box jump, you know, like some kids and adults for that matter have a real, you know, fear or mental block of like jumping to a height. So, um, and they'll see kids jumping on bigger boxes and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can't do that. I can't, you know, and it's like, you don't have to do that now. Like that's, that's, but you could one day do that, but let's just start with this one, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's, you know, teaching them and we practice what we preach too. You know, we've got to make sure our coaches, you know, all our coaches are um, active and, you know, we, we often share stories of our, you know, successes and our failures and our, you know, attempts to do, you know, all sorts of things. And, and I think the kids relate to that too. They see that, um, you know, I think last year I sort of was determined to, you know, be able to do handstand walking. So I practiced and I practiced and I practiced and I, you know, I got some, a coach to help me and, and got there in the end. But it was really cool to be able to share that journey with them too, to say there was a time where I, I, watched, I watched a coach do handstand walking and I laughed at it thinking, that's just some, and I remember the words coming out of my mouth. That is just something I will never be able to do. Like not in a million years, you know? Um, you know, at that time I felt I was limited by that thinking, can't imagine I would ever be able to do that. Um, but now I can. So it's just, you know, that, and, but to be able to sort of share the journey and, and, you know, but they, you know, they look up to us. So it's important that we practice what we preach. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Sam, um, so many insights and I think it's, you know, you provided such a clear picture of how, how from a, you know, 10,000 foot view, um, I think that'd be 3000 meters for you. Um, you know, how, <laughs> how, how to, you know, how to approach this whole youth fitness game. It's, it's awesome. If, if people want to find out more about you or, or get in touch with you, is there, um, a couple of places they can go online? Yeah, sure. Um, our website is um, fitterfutures.com.au and my email address is sam at fitterfutures.com.au. So I'm always happy to talk to anyone who sort of shares the same passion as I do about, you know, working with youth and, um, yeah, drop awesome. me a line. Awesome. Well, I think by the time this airs, your new facility will be open. So yes. that would be awesome. People can go check it out. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I know it's... Cool. Uh, it's only 6.38 in the morning there, so I appreciate you coming on. <laughs> oh, no, that's and, okay. And doing the that's all right. I've got, um, I'm in that headspace at the moment where I wake up at like, you know, 5 a.m. and there's like a million things in my head. Oh, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a pen and paper beside my bed and at the moment it's like starting by right. What are all the things I've got to do today? So 
that's all right. I'm actually, this is, this is fine. Good. Just to it. Good. Well, if you figure out how to turn off that thing in the morning, you let me know. Oh yeah. No, that's my next thing I want to learn this year, how to meditate. So I can like turn that yeah. off. That'd be good. Yeah. I don't know if it, I don't know if it works like that, but if you find out, let me know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Mathers. Thanks for having me. Hey, fitness fans, don't leave yet. It's your host, Eric Malzone, And I have a quick favor to ask. Actually, three favors. So number one, if you're a fan of our show, I asked you to do something that takes under three minutes. Go to iTunes, please, and subscribe to our show. Please, please, please. It means so much to us. It's so important. And then give us a favorable review. We would really, really appreciate it. And uh, I can't tell you how much it means and helps us out. So I know it takes two minutes of your day and uh, it means a lot to us. So please do that. Number two, go to our YouTube channel or Fitness Marketing Alliance and uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel there. Number three, if you like this episode or any of the episodes that we've released, share it on social. That's huge. That's a big deal for us. And we put a lot of work into these episodes uh, trying to give you great actionable content uh, for the fitness industry. So that would mean a lot. And that's it. So we have some big plans coming up for this show. I'll be talking about that in the next couple episodes. But thank you so much for listening. It means so much. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I love to hear from everybody. Eric, E-R-I-C at fitnessmarketingalliance.com.